and Ian talking about like this may take longer than expected. Like, yes, Nick, you're absolutely right to read it as the crafts are laying the groundwork for a leverage game, a power struggle, that sort of thing. And I just, to me, that would be a humongous mistake. This t- this team, this franchise needs to move on as quickly as possible because of what's happened in the last five years. It's time for a fresh start. Get going. Get going in the other direction. If this is dragging out until the Senior Bowl and crap like that, no. Come on. Get on with it. It feels like this podcast has been three years in the making. Uh, He's Greg. I'm Nick. We both have our power back. Greg finally got his internet back today. So here we are. Here we are getting you ready on a holiday weekend to talk about uh, the Patriots. Of course, we got a Broncos game on Christmas Eve night of all times. But before we get into all of that, this episode brought to you by FanDuel, exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. All right, Greg, let's start with Trent Brown because I, I found his comments this week pretty interesting. Uh, he said that everybody in the locker room wanted uh, Malik to play, thought that Malik could play, wanted him to get a shot. He said that uh, he's happy that Malik gets a chance to play his real position or whatever. Just your thoughts overall as far as what Brown had to say. And, and let's start with how Cunningham was handled and what you've heard about that. Let's start there. So... You know, on Malik, um, look, the Patriots made their evaluation of him. Uh, They gave him a big signing bonus to come on as an undrafted free agent. They evaluated him as a wide receiver. You know, I I don't know if I can really fault them um, for that. I think that, and look, nobody bats a thousand. Um, So I'm not going to, you know, condemn them on that. Like, you know, all right, you made your evaluation. Maybe you rethink things in the offseason. You don't really think about that stuff until after the season. Once you start going down a road of Malik Cunningham's a wide receiver, it's impossible to just change streams all of a sudden and make him a quarterback in in the, the way that the NFL works, the way that the Patriots system works. Like there's too much work has been done, uh, you know, with the offense to all of a sudden you know, bring in a new guy. That's why you don't see a lot of quarterback changes in the NFL in general um, during the season. So look, you know, I'm not going to come down hard on the Patriots for their initial, uh, initial evaluation of Malik Cunningham. Um, We've seen it work with other people. Julian Edelman had worked college quarterback. Jacoby Myers was a college quarterback at one time. Like they kind of had a good track record at this. And, you know, they saw that Malik could follow in the footsteps of these guys. So I'm not going to kill him for that. You know, however, you know, just their them letting him go, uh, you know, it, it, at a time when we know that this roster in general just doesn't have talent, especially on offense. I think we've said it like it's just it's just dumb. You know, they they wouldn't have allowed this to happen to a defender or a special teams guy. And, you know, God forbid they don't claim a special teams linebacker and, you know, let Malik Cunningham go. So, you know, that's where I have issue. As far as Trent Brown, you know, it's Trent being Trent. And this is the kind of stuff that you get on losing teams where there's not much to say at the end of the season. He hasn't even been, you know, out there. I don't know why he's mouthing off. Um, You know, like I said, every season you get to December and it's sort of, all right, where's Trent Brown on the give a crap meter? (laughs) Uh, at this time of year because he doesn't have a good track record. I don't like him speaking out of turn. I don't know who he thinks he is. Maybe he's trying to shoot his way out of town uh, for next season. He is going to be an unrestricted free agent. He talked about that in terms of uh, when he got his tweak to his contract. You know, he talked about, you know, one of the big factors was he gets to be a free agent again after the season. So, you know, Trent is Trent. Um, He's a mercenary at this point plays well when he's motivated and ready to go. Sometimes he doesn't play well. Um, So his comment, as far as everybody, I I get it. I understand it. It doesn't surprise me that he says this stuff about, you know, everybody 
thought that, you know, he was a quarterback and should have played quarterback, should have gotten, he couldn't get, even get a goddamn red jersey in the words of Trent Brown, which meant he couldn't get a quarterback jersey ever. He was always in a wide receiver jersey. Um, look, I understand it. When you get quarterback play the way that they they have, you know, you see the players see the way the, the quarterback position is going in the NFL and the Patriots are still using – you know, sort of dinosaurs compared to the rest of the league. I can understand the frustration, but, you know, in general, it's Trent being Trent, and this is what you get on losing teams. People start to snipe. Yeah, I will say that, you know, other guys did talk about Malik Cunningham in glowing terms, Matthew Judon, and uh, many other guys, many other, Jalen Mills, and the list goes on. Jaylen Dietrich Mills. Wise was yeah. very nice to Malik at the podium. How much of that is actually well because they truly honestly believe that Malik deserved that opportunity at quarterback? How much is it just frustration with the quarterback position? We won't know. The Trent Brown stuff's interesting, though, because, you know, when you look at the free agency market this offseason, there aren't a lot of tackles. And so, you know, Trent, he could make the point of I'm one of the most valuable tackles that are going to be on the free agency market this offseason. And if the Patriots don't want to deal with the headaches, they don't want to sign him to a short-term incentive-laden deal if he can't get something else out there, you do wonder, does that kind of put the Patriots in a difficult position? Will they feel like they have to spend a first-round or second-round pick at tackle? Because, hey, Owenu might work out at right tackle, might, but we need that left tackle. And in a perfect world, if Trent Brown made sure that he had his ish together and didn't ruffle feathers like he always does – the Patriots could could have more options on the offensive line, Greg. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, you know, we've talked about this before, whereas their, their failure to start the succession process at different positions, especially tackle, especially tight end, um, let alone, you know, quarterback uh, after Brady, and they put themselves in this position where, you know, you look at it and right now both tackles, they're, best tackles by far Trent Brown and Michael Winnie are both unrestricted free agents at the end of the season and if they go I don't even know what they're left with I mean they don't have anybody who could I mean you know we haven't seen well we haven't seen much of Calvin Anderson Vidarian Lowe Tyrone Wheatley um you know I, I don't think Riley Re I think he's up after this year I think it was only a one-year deal um but yeah I mean you know, look, it, it, that's why I was pounding the table for a tackle last year and a tight end. All their tight ends are free agents as well. And, you know, this is if you ask me right now, probably what happens is the Patriots probably use if it's a top two pick, they use their top pick on a quarterback. And then they're looking for, you know, tackle next, probably in the second round. They might have to trade back up into the first round to get one of the. Yeah, I was looking at some of the draft valuations. It sounds like there's about six to eight tackles with first round grades. You know, if they trade it back up into one uh, into the first round, you know, you know, what does that do? Um, so, yeah, I think that they're I think th they could very well be faced with bringing Trent Brown back because I don't think he's going to have a huge market. And, you know, given his history, the only place he's somewhat worked and been tolerated and hasn't really been run out of the building, you know, halfway through the year that happened at the end of San Francisco happened with the Raiders. This is the only place where Trent Brown has sort of worked. So it might not be a big market for him. You just wonder if the Patriots want to bring him back because of, you know, just the nonstop stories that this guy can create. You wonder, you really wonder. And if you bring him back, you better have a backup plan because if something goes off the rails, you need somebody else to be able to plug that hole. All right, Burt Breer, your friend on NBC Sports Boston, the pregame last weekend, Greg. Something jumped out at me that, that Burt said. Said that teams that have been doing the due diligence on Belichick, thinking of maybe bringing him in, they believe that there's going to have to be a checks and balances. They do not believe that Belichick is going to be the guy to run the entire program. And, and I have a couple of questions off of what Bert said. Number one, do you think Belichick will get full power if he goes elsewhere? Good question. Um, I think that I think that somebody ultimately will give him that. 
um, you know, I'm sure, you know, he'll sweet talk them with, you know, my, you know, personnel guy, you know, he, he yes, he's going to be under me and I'm going to have final say, but, you know, he's largely going to be in charge of, you know, picking the personnel. I think somebody at the end of the day will give Bill that. Um, the other question, which you're probably about to ask is, should he get that? I, <laughs> I don't think he should at all. Nope. I would never do that. I would never um, agree to that here. It's, it, I, it, I think that Bill Belichick, in terms of game planning, knowing what the Patriots need to do to win that game against that opponent that week, I still think he's on top of his game. I think he's one of the best in the league at that. The problem with the Patriots and where they have fallen to, it's all personnel. It's all because of Bill's, his attitude towards personnel, his uh, his attitude towards offensive personnel, his attitude towards, you know, he'd rather have, you know, fi- uh, 48 good, solid football players that follow directions than take risks on, you know, upper, upper level guys. And so uh, I, I would never agree to that if I was in, if I was an owner of an NFL team, but I do think somebody will do that. Just there, they'll be so desperate for the legitimacy, the name, the momentum that bringing in a Bill, Bill Belichick, you know, I, I think somebody will do that. See, if I'm somebody else too, I think of it, like this. Okay, Belichick having more on his plate at this point in time in his life, his in-game decision-making has not been great either. And I think we have seen that slide a little bit over the past couple of years. So if I'm bringing Bill in, I want to put less on his plate. I want him fully functioning, fully focused, fully thinking about the operation. Like game day execution has not been sharp. Fourth down decisions have not been sharp. We've seen that, right? So I would want Bill to be fully focused on that and say, hey, man, like delegate more. And as far as the front office, we're going to put somebody else in charge of that area. Now, here's another question I have for you. If Belichick, because we know these conversations are happening, they're already happening. This is not like uh, the, the season ends and then all of a sudden there's a rush of phone calls. Trust me, these things are being discussed in some circles, not not saying Belichick's picking up the phone and having conversations, but teams are doing due diligence and all that stuff, as Bert said. If Belichick figures out rather quickly after this season ends that he's not going to get the power that he wants, he's not going to have that autonomy. Do you think that makes him more open to the idea of staying here in New England, saying to himself, you know what, if I'm not going to get that power elsewhere, Robert wants to take the personnel from me, but I might as well just stay here where I'm comfortable and and let this contract run out and just go through 2024. If, if, Robert is okay with that. So we'll get to that in a second, but I I just wanted to go back to something that you said about Bill, you know, uh, you know, sort of saving Bill from himself and and putting him in position where, you know, he's just coaching. He's just worried about that. He's not worrying about X, Y, and Z. That's where I have a little trepidation, even though I, you know, I, I did say that I feel still think Bill Belichick, the game planner is, uh, at the top of the game, I think he's I think he's near the top in the league. One thing that you know your points brought up to me was you know in training camp, like I was watching Bill and and remember you know when when McDaniel's was here, McDaniel's almost exclusively handled all things offense, and you know it sort of allowed Bill to do other things and the, the things that you talked about, and I thought like. Bill O'Brien, while I knew he wasn't going to have the cachet with Belichick that McDaniels did, um, you know, I did think that 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 was going to be a bonus. And we talked about it, that, you know, watching him at training camp, it just seemed like, you know, he was he was back to like, you know, throwing different scenarios at the offense and defense. And, and, you know, he was back to like cooking up stuff. And I was excited about that for the team. And, you know, that just hasn't come to fruition which it it gives me trepidation about like, you know, exactly where is Bill as a, you know, in-game coach? Like he used to be the best. I don't know if he is anymore. If, if this is taking some, if this is allowing him to float between offense, defense, and special teams this season, you know, what does that say about where he is? Um, You know, the, the scenario that you lay out, I, I agree with you. I think that, 
at the end of the day, could we get in a situation where Bill looks and, and you know, he's talking back channels to other teams about what might things look like and somebody's not ready to give him, you know, either the power and or the money or both that he's expecting. I, I do think that makes it more likely that he's back and that he, and, and this is something that we were going to talk about. And we might as well talk about it now is, you know, I've been told by people close to Bill that when it comes time that when he talks to Robert, Bill's going to go in on the offensive. He is going to have a game plan. He's going to have an end game in mind, whether that's, you know, that could be as you're outlining right now, that could be, I want to stay here, but I'm going to cook the books to where, how I want it. Um, but give Robert the illusion that we're changing things or I'm putting craft in a corner. So he has to fire me and I get to do what I want to do. You know, he has, he has to pay me all that stuff. Um, so I do think that it, it's in the realm of possibility. I think it's a good possibility that Bill goes into that meeting with Robert and Robert says, okay, so Bill, what are we going to do? You know, how do we get here? How do we get out of this? Do you want to be here? That sort of thing. And Bill's like, Bill goes in, you know, Robert, I've thought about it a lot. I've, I've realized a lot this season. You know, I messed up the coaching staff last year. I messed it up a little bit this year, you know, but really the personnel thing, it hasn't worked out. I realized that this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put X in charge, but it's somebody who's affiliated with Bill, that Bill knows he's going to acquiesce to everything that Bill wants. He's going to give Bill the type of player that he wants. He's, you know, he's going to be in lockstep and, and he might be like, that guy reports to you, Robert, but Bill really knows that guy's really going to report to him. Like he's, he's going to report or he's going to propose some sort of sham arrangement like that, that makes it, that he thinks it makes it palatable for Robert to keep him and that it saves face that he can announce these are the structural changes that we're bringing to the New England Patriots. The head coach and the GM are going to report to me. They're going to operate separately, but together and all that bull crap. Yeah, I do. I do think that's a possibility. And I think it'll be interesting to see what kind of market, what information Bill gets before the end of the season that'll shape that meeting with Robert Kraft and ultimately what happens here. The only thing as we talk about this idea of how this break will happen if it does happen, Ian Rappaport over the weekend, and I appreciate Tom Curran's work, and I appreciate Ian's work. Uh, I was a little confused by the semantics games that were being played over the last week yeah. or so about whether it was a firm decision or a soft decision or a, whatever the hell kind of – I, I just – I didn't quite get it, get it, but – Let's just say in that report, Ian Rappaport says that there's going to be a period of evaluation. And that stood out to me. I wonder, mm -hmm. because we've 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 talked about this, Greg, and everybody's talked about this, but how would it happen and and who has the leverage and would Belichick force Kraft's hand? Could Kraft trade Belichick? I do wonder if if Gerard Mayo, and we'll get into him in a little bit, but if Gerard Mayo is the succession plan still to this day, does that allow Kraft to drag his feet with Belichick? Does that allow Kraft to say, hey, Bill, look, you're under contract through 2024. I want you as the head coach. We're going to bring somebody else from the outside in as far as a personnel guy. You coach the football team. That's the offer. You want to stay? That's what you do. Belichick pushes back. Kraft waits it out. So, okay, fine. Because then Belichick, he's missing all of these opportunities that are out there, right? All these other jobs are drying up. And people might say, well, Nick, you know, that would, that would limit the field for the Patriots. Uh, 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 uh. Not if Kraft wants Mayo. Kraft has, if Kraft wants Mayo, that could be the ace in the pocket. He could say, Bill, take your time. Because, I already have your, your successor. I, I already know who's going to be the guy. So head coach or nothing. And if you want to go elsewhere, I'll be willing to work that out. We either work a trade for you or you're staying here as the head coach, or you can sit out a year. I think that's the period of evaluation. Greg makes me wonder if Kraft is going to slow play this thinking I've got Mayo in the back pocket, even the GM side of it. I've got Elliot Wolf. I've got guys in that front office that can take over. They've been doing all the homework anyway. If you know, if if Kraft really wants to keep this, Bill O'Brien, Gerard Mayo, and he's okay with somebody in the front office just being promoted, Kraft could make this pretty difficult for Belichick. 
to give in and say, all right, just just trade me and get me the hell out of here. Yeah, um, he could. I'm just getting I'm getting like a popsicle headache, like thinking of this and like, you know, this whole like evaluation period thing. Yeah. I mean, you know, the bottom line is it's just it's ridiculous. It's either you want Bill Belichick to be your coach or you don't. And like, you know, you're going to you're going to go through power struggles. And, and, you know, it is the behind the scenes there right now, not just with ownership, but on the coaching staff and the front office. It is a bit like Game of Thrones there. Yeah. um, Right now, there's a there's there's a lot going on behind the scenes. And by the way, I I teased my friend uh, Seth Wickersham this week. I texted him. I was like, all right. So when's your Belichick bomb? gonna drop because (laughs) and he just sort of like he played dumb he kind of gave me a shrug i know he i don't know this for a fact but you know knowing seth and van natta and espn and how they like to do things there's no way seth has to finish it off he has to i think he's already had like two sort of bombshell patriots pieces um you know i think one off of uh you know spygate uh, and sort of the ramifications of that, of course, the Brady Belichick dynamic, and then he's got to finish it off. If this is the end of Belichick, like he, I fully expect a Seth Wickersham bomb that will explain a lot of things and a lot of the a lot of the 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 mechanisms, the Game of Thrones stuff that's going on behind the scenes. I fully expect it probably the week of the final game that that he'll drop it. So I just wanted to say that because it was just occurred to me the other day. Uh, but you know. Like, I don't want the games to be played like it's either it's either you want Bill or you don't. And if you don't want him, just say, all right, you know, you're firing him. But, you know, flowery uh, press release, whatever, you know, we're, we've decided to mutually part ways. We wish Bill Belichick the best of luck. He's the best there ever was. He'll have a, he'll always have a home here. Can't wait to, you know, unveil the statue of him and have a Bill Belichick day down the road. Um, but the Patriots are going in another direction. Like I evaluation period and Ian talking about like, this may take longer than expected. Like, yes, Nick, you're absolutely right to read it as the crafts are laying the groundwork for a leverage game, a power struggle, that sort of thing. And I just, to me, that would be a humongous mistake. This This team, this franchise needs to move on as quickly as possible because of what's happened the last five years. It's time for a fresh start, get going, get going in the other direction. If this is dragging out until the senior bowl and crap like that, no, come on, get on with it. Score early this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's 150 bucks. If your team wins, If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. I love the app. I use it all the time, all over the place. So visit FanDuel.com slash Boston and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. All right, we'll we'll get back to some of the Kraft Mayo stuff in a few, but I did want to hit the Chiefs game before we move on here. Did you have an issue? We talked about Belichick's in-game coaching over the last couple of years. Did you have an issue with the coaching versus the Chiefs, Greg? Yep, absolutely. I thought um, I did not like starting before halftime when there was 35 seconds left. They had two timeouts. Yep. They just ran and went into the locker room like, I think it was, was a 14 to 10 at that point? Um, Something like that. Um, You know, at least give a couple of plays, a screen, something to pop Douglas, like, you know, try to get a chunk play, you know, try a sideline out, uh, you know, something to, you know, maybe we get a field goal before halftime. I don't know, but I didn't like that. And then I didn't like the second half where I thought that, you know, there were a lot more first down runs, um, now, I'm not blaming Bill O'Brien because I do think that Bill manages, uh, Bill Belichick manages a lot of this stuff and, and dictates how the team plays. Um, I do understand his point about that they couldn't 
couldn't hold up in the in pass blocking, and I do understand that. There are other ways to play offense. I see it every week in the NFL no, where line no. play is terrible. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't, you know, a bootleg outside, like move the pocket, like quick game, like mix and, and like there are ways to do things. I've seen this team, you know, in the past when the offensive line has had, you know, injury issues or Jacoby Brissett is under center uh, on a short week. And the undefeated Texans are coming in here and they post a shutout and win like 20 to nothing. I've seen these things, but it's just like it, it's Nick. It, I don't know how you feel about this, but to me, the the defining sort of motto of Belichick, the, the later years, the declining years here has been like. If it's just too hard nah, I don't want to do it It's if it's just, you know, we've had coaches leave. You know, I could bring in other people from outside, you know, better coaches. Nah, that's just too much work. I don't want to do that. You know, do I want to go get, you know, players that might have high upside but might be a pain in the ass to deal with? No, I'd rather coach the guys I want to coach. Like, and you know, and and when it comes to games, it's, you know, do we want to push the issue? Do we want to get creative? Nah, Let's just take the air out of the ball and play to our defense. Maybe we get lucky. I mean, he basically predicted the Kadarius Tony was going to drop a ball in Jelani Tavai's <laughs> hands. Where he's like, "What do you mean? You mean the interception you got? Yeah, the interception." And like, it's just if it gets too complicated, you know, the cap gymnastics to move move cap space around so you can sign somebody early. Nah, I don't want to do that. It's too too. It's just you know, if it's too much work. He just doesn't want to do it anymore. And uh, the second half to me was, uh, I hated it. I thought it was, I thought it was another example. And you and I have talked about this the past few years, some of the Buffalo games, just managing the game, you know, managing not to get blown out, not to get embarrassed. So the stats look good and all that stuff. I, I, I hated it. Oh, don't even get me started on the drive with four minutes left. I wanted to, strangle somebody like it was just <laughs> it was embarrassing you knew they just didn't want to throw a pick six or fumble in the end zone and and all of a sudden them get the 30 points and that's what they were doing and I, I thought it was I thought it was awful mosey on through mosey on through that possession now oh, we you know what we're good which uh, no reason to no huddle here no reason to rush why, why show urgency we're fine as long as we don't get blown out that that's how it came across and, you know, I, I said this on my podcast, The Nick Cattle Show, uh, this week. Speaking of trying so hard, I feel like people are now trying so hard to either explain why Belichick is doing what he's doing, find, a, find some kind of, you know, oh, this is why, this is why he's doing it. They're trying mm -hmm. so hard to justify so like. Oh, Bill's tanking. That that's why he's coaching this way. Bill's tanking. Oh, well, he's coaching that way because he had injuries on the offensive line, which he brought up, which I thought was ridiculously weak in the post game. Oh, he's he's got job security. You know, he's he's coaching this way because he actually wants the better pick and he knows he's going to You know why Bill Belichick coached the way he coached on Sunday? Because that's how Bill Belichick coaches. That's how he's coached since 2012. He has mm -hmm. literally been one of the most conservative coaches on fourth down in the league for more than 10 years with Tom Brady as his quarterback with, with, with Rob Gronkowski and Julian Edelman in a fully healthy offensive line. He has coached this way for more than a decade. He's not the fourth and two Belichick anymore. That Belichick is dead. That Belichick is buried, which I found interesting because remember fourth and two the idea was we can't give the football back to Peyton Manning because he's Peyton Manning. But you gave the football back to Patrick Mahomes down three possessions in a fourth quarter. And and don't tell That's me about the defense. You know, oh, well, it's because he trusts his defense more. If you trust your defense more, then you go for it from your own 42 because you mm -hmm. trust your defense to come up with a stop. If you trust your defense wholeheartedly, you're not trying to play field position in the fourth quarter. It, that's who he is, folks. That that's it. Stop trying to stop trying to think so hard about this. And, and, and the you reason brought up a good point. Just just real quick, your your point on the Colts was really good. And I just wanted to. Uh, so I don't know if you saw it, but Matt Castle on the the post game show, they brought up there was a Colts game 
yeah. in that 2008 season when Castle was the quarterback. And like they went, he basically, Castle was like, as long as they got the fourth and manageable, they were going for it because of who was on the other sideline and Peyton Manning. And, you know, that's Patrick Mahomes right now. And, and you know, just to see where, you know, he used to be Bill Belichick to where he is now. And I understand the team's not as good because of his doing as general manager. But, you know, the the – yeah, I think I think this all goes to he doesn't have a, a very high tolerance for risk anymore in any sort of way when it comes to the Patriots football team. He would love to win 16 to 13 every week. I, I honestly believe he'd love that. He he would get his jollies if this team was a 10 win team winning, you know, 16, 13 every week. He'd be thrilled with that. He honestly would. And by the way, yes, winning matters, right? So if you're winning and it's ugly, you can live with that. And that's that's really my final point on the Belichick stuff with this is people people talk to, you know, Greg and I on Twitter, social media, whatever, and and they'll say, Well, Belichick's always been this way. Post game press conferences. He co he he coached this way, Nick. You just said it. He's coached this way for more than a decade and they won Super Bowls. Yeah. But when you're not winning, there's a difference. But when the cha- when the league is evolving and you're losing and you're a three win team, there's a difference when you're winning Super Bowls. And yes, you are justified to stand up there and say, I do what's best for the football team. Like you had nothing to lose in this game. Nothing. Belichick's not thinking about a pick. I'm sorry. He's not thinking about, you know, where are we in the draft right now? He's thinking, I don't want to get whooped. A- and that's been his thought process. For a long time now, I don't want to get whooped. The aggression is gone. So it is what it is. Don't overthink it. Bailey Zappi, first half to second half. What the hell is going on here? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I do think the overall thing is, you know, he's sort of a, you know, we talk about teams that are like 50 minute teams that are good, you know, or maybe you know, 30 minute team, he's a 30 minute quarterback. I mean, that's sort of where he is that the, you know, the longer he plays, the more he gets exposed, unless it's against a Browns defense or a Lions defense, which was at the time that they played them last year among the worst in the league. And, um, you know, but I, I did reach out, I reached out to a chief source who was very close to the coaching staff and, and sort of, you know, I asked him, you know, what was the difference? And I would say, um, you know, the big thing was, I think these teams, they underestimate Zappy when they go into these games and they're like, oh, we, we don't need to pressure a whole lot. We don't need to expose ourselves in coverage very much because, you know, he's just a backup and he's limited and stuff like that. Then he gets in the game and, you know, gives Zappy credit. Kid comes out and he plays well. He really does. I thought he was outstanding in the first half of this game. Um, the best, if you put it out over a full game, it'd be the best. So I don't know if I've explained this on here before. But I have this Mac Jones database from, you know, when he was a rookie breaking down all sorts of categories for each of his starts. And if if Zappi put together a whole game like the first half, that would have been the best quarterback game by a, by a Patriots quarterback since Mac Jones um, started as a rookie. Um, unfortunately, his second half was the worst game uh, by a quarterback <laughs> since Mac Jones was a rookie. And I, I think they <laughs> underestimate him and they come out and they – they just tighten things up. They bring a little bit more pressure. Saw him get him on a couple cornerback blitzes that he should have seen that he should have been, he should have been prepared for. Everybody knows Spagnolo loves to do that. Um, you know, you got to watch, uh, Trent, what's his name? The cornerback. Um, he can blitz from anywhere. Spags loves to do that, but really they just, and, and you notice this against the Steelers also, the Steelers sort of played back in the first half, you know, 21 to three. And then all of a sudden in the second half, they just get up. They're like, oh, yeah, the Patriots wide receivers can't run by us. Yeah. Zappy's not going to throw it by us. So we're just going to get up on it. It makes it muddier, uh, disguise a little bit better. And he, you know, and he gets exposed. This is not to say, you know, Bailey hasn't done a good job. I do think he has, even though you look at a lot of the advanced analytics and I saw you tweet this yeah. um, and I and I'd seen this from another place as well that uh that Mac Jones has been more efficient this year than Bailey Zappy. Now, some of it's skewed because. Zappy has gotten in the games and thrown picks in, in sort of desperate situations. So, you know, I don't want to beat on him too much, but you know, he's just, he's just limited. And once teams figure him out a little bit, uh, 
then they sort of have him. But, you know, I don't want to take anything away from Bailey. He's played really well for stretches and done a good job. And he certainly, at this point in time, he is a much better quarterback than Mac Jones is. Does that mean he's a better quarterback than Mac Jones? No, not in my opinion. But just where they are right now, uh, Bailey Zappi's uh, much better. And I did want to bring up that, you know, Mac uh, Bailey has started to get the Mac Jones treatment in, in, in terms of QB pressure. There was a ton of this game. The second half, it was 64%. I'm sure Mac watching the film was Bailey was like, now you know what I went through. Yep. And so th- that has a big part to do with it as well. All right. Before we get to the game coming up this weekend, I, I do want to go back to Mayo and kind of further discuss the idea of him and, and, and what's going on with him. Because I know that you wrote that story about Kraft and Belichick and Mayo and the part of Mayo rubbing people the wrong way in the building caught a lot of attention. Uh, you mm-hmm. got lots of run for you. Lots of Boston Sports Journal promotion, baby, over the last week or so. Uh, there, there's more there's more meat on that bone because we, we touched on it a little bit last week. But when, when you look at this, is there anything I, I first would ask you, is there anything you'd like to add to your reporting? Because, again, a lot of people are discussing it. I know Devin McCourty mm-hmm. went on EEI and talked about it. Anything you'd like to add from your point of view, Greg, whether it's your reporting on it behind the scenes and, and how you got to what you what you got or just on the situation overall? Um, not a whole lot. Like, you know, I'm, uh, I don't want to get into specifics because I think it might reveal some of my sources. But, you know, I'll start off by saying that um, even since my report came out and the conversations that I've had, um, I, I am 100 um, percent. I 100 percent stand behind my reporting and and what I put in there. And, you know, some people have told me behind the scenes that I was actually being, you know, pretty kind um, to Gerard, but, Hmm. you know, um, you know, and, and, you know, look, it's easy to say there are competing interests and this and that, and, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to deny that, but, you know, just the varying sources that I've talked to, um, you know, behind the scenes with the Patriots, um, you know, I, I, I don't think that that that's what this is. And I've checked it out with enough people um, to, you know, feel 100 percent confident in in what I've reported. And I stand behind it resolutely. Um, you know, I, I just wanted to say, you know, because I didn't have a chance on Felger and Mass to say, say I have absolutely nothing against Gerard. I've never had a bad interaction with him. I had the utmost respect for him as a player. Um, I think he's a good coach. I think the part of the reason why Juwan Bentley and Jelani Tavai are as good as they are for how limited they are is because of Gerard Mayo. And and I don't know if this defense would be anywhere close to where it is if he wasn't on this staff. And I was extremely fearful of Gerard, you know, leaving at some point in time, maybe to get it, be a DC someplace else to call his own, uh, his own game, that sort of thing to further his career and further his resume uh, in the eyes of, of other people. Cause you know, some people brought up to me, well, you know, cause I've asked the question and we might get into it here or some other time, you know, about like, you know, what's the case for Gerard Mayo? Yeah. I mean, you know, as, as the next Patriots coach, I mean, look, do I think he's extremely impressive, extremely smart, tough, can lead a room? Yeah. But to follow Bill Belichick, I mean, you know, at least D'Amico Ryan's ran a top defense in the league for a couple of years for the 49ers. Um, so at least he had that. And you could point to that, that he runs his own side of the, of the building. Now you could also say Gerard runs the defensive meetings, So that's good, but he's still not out there calling games. So, you know, but I just want to say that it, I've never had a bad interaction with Gerard Mayo. I have nothing against Gerard Mayo. I think he's going to be a very good head coach in this league. I just believe in people behind the scenes, almost universally believe this is too early for him, that he is not ready for this. And I don't think this was the plan for Gerard, that this soon would be his time. It would be more like a year, two, three down the road, um, you know, as he as he took on more duties, which he did this offseason in terms of sitting in and on uh, player evaluation meetings, free agent meetings, stuff like that, draft meetings. Like, you know, he was very prominent in those. And that's that's good. but. You know, look, it's my job. Uh, it's it, it's not my job to just rubber stamp what the Patriots are going to do. You know, my job is to take every single candidate, and I'm going to start to get into this at BSJ about like, 
you know, making the case for even Bill Belichick, the case for and against, the case for and against Gerard Mayo, Mike Vrabel, Ben Johnson, you know, what have you, you know, but it's, it's my job to pick things apart. Like I just, because just because people think he's the heir apparent and look, I've talked up Gerard Mayo in terms of, I think there are ups, there's upside to Gerard Mayo in terms of, you know, yes, he has a lot of, he, he is similar to, and we talked about this before, similar to, you know, Bill Parcells was really good in some ways. Bill Belichick was his understudy, but Bill, Bill knew more about player valuation and other things than, than Bill Parcells did. So that made him sort of an elevated candidate from Parcells, sort of an evolution. And I view Gerard very much like that with Bill, that he has a lot of, this is all he's known. To me, this is a big minus when you look at the track record of people who have only been here and under Bill. But, you know, if you're the crafts and you look at it and say, all right, he's got the baseline of Bill, but he thinks of things, he's been in the business world, he thinks of things in an elevated platform, a more universal platform, a more advanced platform, then then that's the case, some of the case for Gerard. But, I, you know, I just want to reiterate, I have nothing against Gerard. He, I think he's going to be a fine head coach you know, someday, but my job is to take every single candidate and put them through the ringer, positives, negatives, everything, or else I'm not doing my job. And I think that would be the case for a lot of reporters, but just because people have been saying, including myself for a long time that I thought he was going to be the successor. That doesn't mean that I just let it go and say, that's okay. And that I just don't feel that I'm doing my job. So this is what people who who never steer me wrong. I think there are issues behind the scenes with Gerard. No, I know there are. Um, I don't think they're huge issues. I don't think they, they were necessarily preclude his being the Patri- Patriots head coach. But, you know, to me, you have to look at a candidate in totality, uh, the pluses, the minuses. And I feel that that's what I am doing here. I will do it with everybody. I've done it with Bill. I've done it with every, you know, every coach, you know, and you know i'm sure there are people out there on twitter who are saying like well there are some sort of racial undertones to me that's absolutely ridiculous you know it, you know like i wasn't hard on matt patricia last year or joe judge or bill o'brien at time like you know look i'm just doing my job i think and my job is to give people the full 100 percent picture of what's going on behind the scenes, all the candidates, all the players. And I feel like I'm not doing my job if I don't do that. I think the plan was clear. Uh, You know, you read the Dan Graziano piece going back a couple of weeks ago. It's so clear what the plan was. If things went perfectly, the succession plan was Belichick piles up wins this year, piles up wins next year, Mm -hmm. breaks Don Shula's record gets the ship steady another year or so of seasoning for Gerard Mayo to learn under the tree. And then 2025 when Belichick's contract is up and he's in his mid seventies and he's broken the record, say la vie, thank you, throw a parade and, you know, and, and do all of the good stuff. And then Mayo walks in, the transition is there. Mayo takes over a winning team with a young quarterback in Mac Jones who has figured the league out et cetera, et cetera. And that plan has been blown up. So it's going to be fascinating to see how the pieces are put back together, which brings me to my last question on this before we get to the game coming up this weekend, sitting here today, Greg, whether it is informed or not, and you can state it on your end is Mayo. Do you think still the favorite to get this job? If Belichick is indeed gone. Um, The short answer is I'm not sure. Um, This is where, you know, you as a reporter and and I feel good about my experience that I have on a lot of big stories. You know, I I don't think that there have been many stories like this um, in Boston. Um, The stakes don't get any bigger. There are, like I said, it's like Game of Thrones behind the scenes because no matter whatever door the, the crafts choose in terms of do they just make a complete departure from the Belichick era, that's a lot of people out of work that have been in Foxborough for a long time. Yep. I, you know, and, and I know there are a lot of, you know, this is where people are looking out for their interests. And I'm well aware of it. I covered, you know, Nick Saban out the door, his arrival 
his departure from Miami. I covered Favre, his departure from the Packers. You know, these are big stories, and you have to be very wary as a reporter of making sure that you're getting all sides and, and everything that you're told from a source, making sure that you go through certain things. You know, there are people who believe that, that, and I certainly uh, this is, this is one source, but I thought I had to turn it in. It's not, you know, but there are other people who feel similarly, but I had one source say that he thought Mayo was a long shot for the job. I don't know what to believe. I I'm just telling you upfront right now. Um, that's my reporting. What do, what do I feel? I feel at the end of the day, when you look at the whole landscape of everything, I don't see how the crafts, given their history and how they came and, and hired uh, Pete Carroll and how they hired Bill Belichick, how you know two coaches who were highly successful defensive coordinators for multiple teams had head coaching experience, and maybe the crafts thought they were they didn't get a fair shake. Uh, Pete Carroll with the Jets, Belichick with the Browns. And they thought there was more meat left on the bone. I just don't see how Gerard Mayo fits in with any of that. Um, and, you know, to me, I will think they would look for more of a sure thing, more experience. Um, I could be totally wrong. They could have thought, you know, different things. And, and uh, but my feeling is, and this is just my guess, my personal opinion, I, I would say the chances of Gerard Mayo being the head coach after this season of the New England Patriots are not very good. And that's my personal opinion. All right. Check us out over at BSJ 50 bucks for the year. Bedard and Giardi tag teaming on the Patriots, all sorts of coverage pillar to post there at BSJ. Uh, We'll get ready for the pick here coming up, but first we remind you this episode is brought to you by FanDuel exclusive wagering partner, of the CLNS media network. New customers receive $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. All right, quick scouting report on the Broncos. Uh, I don't know how much you have actually been able to watch because of your power and internet situation, but uh, just kind of a 30,000-foot view for, about this football team coming up on Christmas Eve night. So a little bit. I skimmed their offense a little bit. Um, it's not all that impressive. I do think they have some nice personnel. I think the offensive line is pretty good. The right guard, um, Minehurst or something like that, he's awesome. Um, he reminds me a lot of Logan Mankins. Oh, isn't it um, that to do that with the, right. with the big belly from like North Dakota or something like that? He was like this big cat. Yeah, he's yeah. freaking good. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> the left guard is their weak spot on the line. He's sort of a, I don't know if it's that, that guy's short and dumpy and doesn't move very well, the left guard. So maybe Christian Barmore it's, uh, can get around him um, with quickness. Uh, but in general, um, this is what I know about the Broncos from talking to people. This, this is going to be a huge game, and I think it's the same for both teams. But Sean Payton does not want to get the third down with Russ Wilson. He gets exposed there on third down. That's when you can keep him in the pocket. He doesn't throw in rhythm with the offense. He runs around, and he's not that fast anymore. Like, he gets into trouble. Sean Payton will try to make this a CFL game. He will try to be, get – you know, only use the first two downs to move the ball. If the Patriots don't force many third down, that's a bad omen for them. The Broncos are one of these teams similar to the Patriots where they need to keep the game in their control. They want it on on their terms. That means, you know, not very high scoring. Um, the defense is okay. Their, their DVOA is worst in the league against the run. I don't think that they're very good on the defensive interior. They have some really good young edge rushers. Pat Sertan is pretty good junior second. Uh, uh, I covered his dad, but it, uh, you know, he's a pretty good corner, not elite, but top 10 ish. Uh, Justin Simmons, the safety is yeah. the real deal. Yeah. You want to keep the ball away from that guy. That dude is awesome and can play some ball. So, you know, I think, I think if whichever team can stay out of third downs uh, in this game, the most, I think that team wins the game. What's your pick? Broncos, I'll give you the line. Broncos giving seven. The over-under number is 34 and a half. So I'm going to go with the Broncos, but not to cover. I think it's going to be a close game. I'm going to say Broncos 2017, something like that. I'm going Broncos. I'm going with the under. Uh, On the road, Bailey Zappi. Yep, Zappi on the road. Uh, Denver, not an easy place to play. Belichick's had his issues at Denver, even with Tom Brady. Um, 
and, and I just Zappy turning into a pumpkin every second half concerns me. And until he's not a pumpkin in the second half, I'm going to guess he'll turn the football over. The Patriots will again go super conservative. They'll try to hold on to their hats and get through. Uh, but I could just see a turnover. You know, I said it last week. You know, I, I got it wrong. I thought the Patriots would be able to cover, but I did say all it takes is one turnover and this entire thing could be screwed up. And there was Zappy throwing it right to a chief in the third quarter to start that start that half. And what do you know? It screwed everything up. Hunter Henry's not practicing. I don't think he's going to play. That hit didn't look great. Ramondre Stevenson's going to be out. So I just, I don't know how they move the football when you take away Hunter Henry. And Denver's going to load up on the run. So, yeah, I'll go Broncos and the under. Am I confident? Of course not, because the product isn't very good. So who the hell knows what's going to happen? Neither team is, you know, the Broncos aren't great, but that's where I'll sit on this one. All right, he's Greg. I'm Nick. Our power is back. Our internet is working. We are happy. Have a Merry Christmas. Uh, don't let the football game ruin your Christmas Eve, okay? Just if you if you got to power through, power through. Don't let it ruin you. Uh, everybody be safe and well in the holiday season. We'll be back early next week with the recap of what I'm sure is going to be a fantastic football game between the Broncos and the Patriots. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays, everybody.